again to Discovery Church. How many of you ready for better this year? Amen. <laughs> believing for better things in 2020, believing for better things in your life, in your future, in your relationships. I believe that's available to you. That's what this series is all about. If you've missed any of them, this is the last message in the installment that we've called Better. God's plan is greater than my plan. You got to go check it out because we really believe that if this year you would just kind of take God up on this challenge of realigning your life and making the, whatever adjustments that you need to in any area of your life that is not living in God's plan, if you just realign, readjust, that this could be the best year of your life. And that's the challenge we kind of have led with in this year and brought some different messages in this series, how to actually see better things happen in 2020. And maybe this year, see, see something different. For a lot of you, you're desperate for different. You're desperate for better. 2019 was not, was not good to you. Even if it was good to you, I promise you this, no matter how good your plans are, God's plan is better. It is better, and you're going to see that, I believe. I'm confident that you'll see that if you just get aligned with God, how awesome he is. Um, before I jump into the message, though, today actually marks the end of our 21 days of prayer and fasting experience. You can go eat, all right? You go eat. At, not right now. After this. After this. I'm ready to eat some sweets. How I many of you know what I'm talking about? I've asked sweets. I've been getting text messages like, Pastor, bring your sweet to you. I'm like, it is brought. Let's go. Where it at? Where it at? I haven't gotten it yet. I'm just kidding. But, but I'm really excited. Uh, what we started in 21 days was is not it's not ending hopefully I, I really i hope that there is some there's some new disciplines and habits and things that we've developed at the beginning of this year to really lean in and listen to god and reprioritize and realign and all that stuff does not stop hopefully it sets the course of what 2020 is going to be so really excited about about um what god is doing in your life and i'm hearing a lot of testimonies and stories already and so many of you are like this is it man I, I got I to gotta see better, and I believe that God is going to do better because his word says this. Here's our theme verse again. Hebrews chapter 6 says, we are confident, and this is why I'm confident, man. I'm not confident in my own strength and my own ability and my own, you know, what I can do for you. No way, man. Uh, we are confident that you are meant for what? Say it out loud one more time. You are meant for what? Better things, man. That's what you were meant for. You were not meant for the lesser life. You weren't meant for mediocrity, that God has better things plan for you, but it's not kind of, it's not what the world has to offer. It really is not. And sometimes we take the bait of better that the world calls better and it leaves us broken. And so we've talked about what better even looks like because the better things of God actually come along with salvation. It, it comes along with this relationship that was started when we gave our life to Christ and the Holy Spirit filled us and made our heart his home that along with this relationship comes it gives us access to these immeasurable, more than I can even imagine kind of life. That's the better things that God has for us today. I want to close out our series and, and, and talk to you about um, the maturity continuum is what I'm calling it. The maturity continuum, because if you want to see better things, and I believe you do, I believe you want to see better things, it isn't, it's not going to come quick and it's not going to come easy. Hey, last week, just for those of you that were with us last week, I called out a few different characters. We were talking about a better purpose, and we studied a few different people like Joseph, the Apostle Paul, Esther. These are all great, amazing examples in the scriptures, but what they fulfilled in their life was not quick or instantaneous. It was a process. Let me say it this way. If you want to see better things, then you need to grow up. Then there are some things in your life that need to mature. I turned 40 years old this last week. 40 years old, and, and I just, can I tell you, it just keeps getting better and better. It really does. I am so blessed by, by God, but just because you're advancing in age does not mean you're advancing in wisdom. And some of you, some of you your, your, your age does not, does not match your, your, your wisdom, and if you want to see the better things of God, they, they, it's not going to come automatic. There is a, 
maturing, a growing up. There really is. If you want to see these better things that come, I'm telling you, if you do, and if you just realign with God and get on God's plan every step of the way, you'll see it just gets better and better and better and better, man. Every year can be better. Every year, I promise you, I look back and I go, my gosh, I'm not where, I'm not exactly where I want to be, but I'm still definitely not where I used to be. It's better. Every year I arrive and I go, wow, God is good. It's better. And that can happen. That's the journey. That's the better things that God has for you. This was what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1. He is the one, <clears throat> he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone, look at this, fully mature in Christ. God wants you to develop. He wants you to grow up. He wants you to become fully mature in Christ. And so I'm hoping to convince you. Actually, I want you to actually convince yourself of some things. Because every one of us are at a stage in the maturity continuum. I'm going to give you three stages of this maturity continuum. And everyone here is at one of these stages of development, of maturation. And, and, and honestly, every, everything that has life in it, everything that, that, that starts out new and with life goes through the same continuum. I'm talking about plans, uh, everything in, in, in God, everything that God has created goes through a maturity continuum. So here, here, write it down. Here's the, what it starts with. The maturity continuum starts with dependence. Let me explain that to you, where you're dependent. So as an infant, every one of us were dependent, right? Some of you had babies. Those infants, life-sucking dependents, you know what I mean? They just, they need you. They need, I'm just kidding. I love my babies, and I love your babies too. But let's be honest, they're dependent. They can't do nothing by themselves. They can't feed themselves. They can't. So here's the, so they can't walk themselves. They can't. Every the infants, so they're not, they're not fit, they're physically dependent upon you taking them around. They're 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 physically dependent upon your you feeding them. So they're dependent upon the nurturing and the care of, of parents or or adults. They're just they're dependent, even emotionally dependent. They feed off of their atmosphere, right? So you're like, everyone be quiet, be quiet. The baby is staying with a nap. And, it's, don't, and, if, and if it gets all crazy and stuff, the, the kids will get crazy. Why? Because they're just dependent. They feed off their atmosphere. They don't own, they, don't, they haven't learned those things just yet. And, and the same is true even with your spiritual life. That when you become, like when you get born again and you, you get you know, saved, give your life to Jesus, you are very dependent upon others pouring into you, nurturing you, caring for you, equipping you, discipling you. This is the natural starting point of anything that has life in it. Any, any new uh, beginning stage, it'll always begin at this. But it's okay for an infant to act this way. But when you are a grown man, you're a grown woman, and you, and you are acting like you need, you're feeding off of other people's, you are dependent upon them, um, like, like your sense of worth and value now come from what people say to you or don't say to you. What they do or they don't do threatens your world. That's where we need to grow up. Here's what dependence is in the paradigm of you. Write it down this way. It's all about you. You. So that's what dependent people say. Dependent always say, you. You made me do this. You got me angry. You, you, it's, oh, it's never, I, dependent people do not own enough, they don't own themselves. So they're emotionally dependent. So they're not encouraging themselves or strengthening themselves. They are, it's, it much has to do with how you treat them and what you say, and, or even intellectually. So people that are intellectually dependent, they can't think for themselves. They can't make decisions for themselves. Uh, they rely on other people to make decisions because they're intellectually dependent, where it's all about other people. And I just want to encourage you today to not rely on others, to keep you feeling good about yourself. It can be, a, it can be an addiction for some of us where we need people to validate us, to appreciate us, to, to you know, commend us. And, and it's like a drug almost. We need our fix. We need, someone to, we need to meet your expectation and meet the, you know, or else we get discouraged and we feel inferior. Here's the problem with staying at this stage of dependent. Um, you're trying to get from people what you can only get from God. People cannot... They are not designed to fulfill every one of your desires and your need. Your worth and your value does not come from another person. It comes from your creator. And if you put that on anybody, you are going to be disappointed. You will be. You're gonna, people will let you down. People will get busy and not show up when you need them 
to show up. People will even turn on you or turn their back on you because they're people. Even Jesus, Jesus himself had, a, had some friends and pe- that people, people turned their back on him. Peter was a close ally, a friend of Jesus, spent nights and days with him, poured into him, and, and Peter didn't show up when, when Jesus needed him the most. Look at Luke chapter 22. Jesus answered Peter, and he says, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. You're going to deny that you even know me three times. Jesus could have allowed Peter and his choices and decisions to make him lose his confidence, to make him doubt his destiny or, or his purpose in life, but he didn't because Jesus was on a different place in the maturity continuum. Jesus was more mature. So I want to encourage you, quit relying on, on people. Quit relying on other people, what they do or don't do for your worth or your value. What they give you or don't give you cannot stop your purpose. Amen, somebody? God breathed his life into you. He's crowned you with favor. Quit waiting for other people to approve you and start approving yourself. Look what Jesus says. I love this in John chapter 5. He says, your approval or disapproval means nothing to me. It means nothing. Whether Look, I don't get my approval from you anyway. I don't get my sense of worth or value from you. I get it from somewhere else. So it don't matter what you think. I know what God thinks. I don't get that from you. It means nothing to me. See, there are people that are present in your life, listen, that should not have passage into your life. Presence does not equal passage. Jesus was talking about religious leaders right here, church-going people. And he said, look, just because you're present, just because you're around me doesn't mean you can speak into me. You better watch who you let speak into your life, okay? Amen, somebody? Listen, people, they might not encourage you. You need to learn how to encourage yourself. People might not make you feel special. You better learn how to make yourself feel special. I am a child of the Most High God, crowned with favor. I'm his masterpiece, okay? You'll have, I'm telling you, you'll have better relationships if you start validating yourself and looking for some, instead of looking for somebody else to validate you, instead of looking for your spouse to validate you, your parent to validate you, your boss to validate you, they are not designed to meet all of your expectations. People are not meant, other people are, are not meant to make you happy. They can't make you happy. They can't fulfill your joy. You're putting an expectation on them that they were never created to carry. Stop looking for people to give you what only God can give you. If you want to see the better things that God has for you, you need to grow up and stop being so dependent, your emotional health on other people, what they say or not say, your spiritual health on what other people are feeding you or not feeding you. You need need to step up and grow up if you want to see the better things of God. There's another level that some of you need to go to. And some of you, maybe you're not, you're not an infant, but spiritually or maybe emotionally, maybe even some of you intellectually, there's just some dependencies that you're just relying way, you're putting way too much expectation on people that needs to be shifted to God. And you need to take a step in some areas of your life. Here's the step. We need to go to, from dependence to independence. Independence. Where, where you develop from infancy, and naturally, you kind of get more and more independent, don't you? I can start walking myself. I can start caring. I can start feeding myself. I can start thinking for myself eventually. I can start regulating my own emotions a little bit. And then until eventually, we're even financially independent and things like that, emotionally independent, until you can finally take care of yourself and you become self-reliant. You'll learn at this stage, if you get to this place of independence, that you can go to God for things and not for people. I can go to God for my encouragement, not, for, not to people. I can go to God for my value and my worth, not to other people. You know, don't, don't wait for anybody to compliment you. You don't need anybody's compliment. You compliment yourself. You look in the mirror in the morning and say, look at you fine looking stud. I don't care if you're not fine. Prophesy that thing. Speak faith in that mirror. You special. <laughs> you, you smart. <laughs> people like you you know whatever it is <laughs> look believe what god, god says look god says i am strong god says i am healthy god says i am a masterpiece god says i am highly favored who cares if you don't favor me i'm favored by god i don't need that from you i don't need that from you i'm not putting that expectation on you i get that from god and that makes me whole it makes me whole don't wait for other people to encourage you encourage yourself don't wait for other people to compliment you compliment yourself don't wait for other people to appreciate you. Appreciate yourself. 
Okay, this is something that, that people on the maturity continuum that have stepped up to an area of self-reliance and dependence have stepped into. They stop putting expectations on people that only God can fulfill. If you're looking to people to, to fulfill those things in your life, eventually you will get, eventually you're going to get bitter. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to resent them because they can't fulfill that. It'll estrange your relationships. It'll cause distance because no one is designed to hold the weight that you're putting on them. It'll sour relationships. It'll ruin relationships. And really, honestly, it's not their fault. It's not their fault. You're just, we're putting way too much there. It was never meant to be there. Look at Philippians chapter 4, 13. This is a great independence verse on the maturity continuum. The Apostle Paul speaking here says, I can do all things. Now here, I, put, I stopped it right there because this is, because much in our culture props up independence as the pinnacle. And, and really what independence does, it, stop, it cuts off Philippians 4.13 right here. I can, I can do all things. I can, I can, and, and honestly, the self-help books, and, and, and it's all about becoming independent and self-reliant and, and financially independent and all that stuff, but I'm going to tell you right now, listen, self, independence is not the pinnacle. Independence is not supreme. You need to get to this place, write it down like this, where you go from the paradigm of you to the paradigm of me, okay? And independence, if you stay here, independence says, I don't need you. I got this. It's all about me. It's all about me. But, the, but Philippians continues. And there's, there's another step that we need to take. For some of you, you need to take this. You're strong. You're self-reliant. You're an independent person. That's an that's accomplishment in and of itself. That's fantastic. That's part of the maturity, maturity continuum. You're growing up. But there's another step that you need to take. And he, he actually talks about it. He says, I can do all things which he has called me to do. Well, actually, I can't do it myself. It's not all about me. No, no, I can do all things only through him who actually gives me that intellect, who gives me the ability, who, who gives me the strength and empowers me to fulfill his purpose. I don't fulfill like my purpose by myself and in my own. Man, I can do it through him though. And I love this out of the Amplified. It says, I am self-sufficient only in Christ's sufficiency. See, as we continue to grow and mature, every person will have the same sense inside of you that says, there's got to be more to this. There's got to be better than this. And even some of you that are very independent today, you've been successful. You are educated. There's an end of you that says, there's got to be more. You were created for so much more than independence. The final stage, and this is how God has created a whole world exists. Everything created by God is created with this third maturity step, interdependence. Everything created by God is interdependent. Everything. Whether it's nature, humanity, all of it is interdependent. And if you think, no, no, it's not, you go ahead and try to take a seed and put it on this stage and see if it'll grow by itself. See if it's not interdependent upon the soil. It doesn't matter what seed and how good the seed is, good seed needs good soil. See, the seed by itself is not, cannot accomplish its purpose. A seed needs a soil, it needs sun, it needs sustenance, and it needs a social network. Come on, that's a whole message right there all in and of itself. Just made that up. No, I was doing some research, and it actually said that the oak trees, the oak trees actually, you can't, oh, you put an oak tree right here, the, the little seed, it ain't going to do nothing. It's interdependent. God has created everything in all creation, cannot achieve the better things, the best things, the purpose, what God designed you for, can't achieve it without interdependence. But you put that seed, that oak tree, in some good soil, give it some sun, give it some sustenance, and give it a social network. They say with the oak trees... It not only grows deep, they grow horizontal. They said that, that it, it, the, the distance between the oak trees that they can socialize, actually, and have a network is about the distance that you can hear the, the leaves rustling in the wind. It's about how long their roots can grow and grab hold of and, and, and create a network, a social network, and they become stronger together. God has created us to live interdependent. And this, this is a paradigm. Interdependence is a paradigm of we. It goes from this dependence, oh, it's all about you, you, I need you, I need you, and it's your fault, and all that stuff, 
to this, oh, it's all about me and I can do it, I can do it, to understanding that the better things are actually accomplished together. You see, if I'm physically, independ- physically interdependent, I'm self-reliant and I'm capable, but I recognize, I realize that I can achieve such greater things when I put smart people and good people around me. Okay, so when I, and when I'm emotionally interdependent, I get my self worth. I get my worth, and my I, I'm very. Uh, I get my sense of self worth from within. But I recognize I also need love, and I need to give love. There's a giving and receiving that I recognize helps me achieve even better things. And then when I'm intellectually uh, interdependent, it means I can have my own thoughts, but I can actually achieve even better and the best thoughts when I get other people around me. We can do better things. Here's what I want you to see. It's not in your notes. Take a picture, write it down, do something. Dependent people need others to get what they want. Independent people can get what they want by themselves. But interdependent people combine their own efforts with others to achieve better things. And if you want to achieve, if you want to see better things, you're going to have to live, you're going to have to understand that we are better Together, here's the catch though, here's the catch. Dependent people, interdependence is is a choice that only independent people can make. Dependent people cannot choose to be interdependent because they don't have the character to do it. They don't own enough of themselves to make that choice. Did you catch that? Okay, because dependent people have given authority away have relinquished ownership of their emotions to someone else's decisions. And I'm either, I'm encouraged or discouraged, happy or down based upon what you're doing or what you're not doing, what you're saying or not doing, what you're doing for me or not doing for me. I am dependent. Therefore, de- dependent people cannot, li- cannot choose to live an interdependent, cannot even see the better things that God has for you. These year after year compound blessings that God wants to do in your life cannot be because here's, here's the bottom line, because you're immature. Can I just punch you in the gut a little bit because I love you. I'm your pastor and I love you. But some of you are too immature to see the better things that God has for you because you've given authority and ownership of your emotions, your spirituality, your intellect, you don't, own, you don't own enough of yourself to give the best. So you get, look, inter, as an interdependent person, I can love more deeply. I can forgive more deeply. I can trust more deeply. You will never see the better things that God has for you if you are dependent upon other people. You'll never see the better things that God has for you if you are independent from other people. You will only see the better things when you recognize that it comes through interdependence. You know why? Because we're better together. That's how God created us, to live, to live this interdependent, that we would not see our potential, that we would not see the, the maximum effectiveness of our purpose and see the, the, the greatest of better things if we are separate from the community of faith. Some of you have even maybe heard that the church in the, the body is a body. The, the people of God is a body, and we're all a part of and play a role, just one role within the body of Christ. It actually comes from Romans chapter 12. A few other scriptures actually talk about the church being a body. Here's what he says, the Apostle Paul, talking about how we are interdependent uh, with each other, that we, are, we rely upon. Although we are self-reliant, there is, we recognize the need for the body. He says, in this way, we are like various parts of the human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. He says, each of us finds our meaning and function as part of the body. But as a chopped off finger or a cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? He says, look, you can, you can be independent. You can try to act like you're self-reliant, but you're not going to be who God has called you to be if you're disconnected from the body. So he goes on. He says, so since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellent formed and marvelously functioned parts in Christ's body, let us go ahead and be who God made you to be. And then he says, he adds, without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other, or trying to be something that we are not, no matter how strong you are, how smart you are, how holy 
You think you are. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. Oh, I've been serving God 40. I don't care if you've been serving God 40 years or 40 minutes. You need people. You need people. And if you want this year to be different, if you want to see better things, then you need to understand that we are better together, that those better things that God, better things that God has for you actually come through the relationships in the body of Christ that he is destined for you. Hebrews chapter 10 says it like this. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. I mean, there's a picture there, right? Like, like a lot of our journey of faith and journey through life takes a lot of swerving. <laughs> like, like we swerve here and, oh man, we get off track here and we get misaligned here and we got to get aligned back. And the, the author of Hebrews is saying, man, hold on, stop swerving around and stop being so inconsistent and let's hold on swervingly to this hope we profess. And he's going to tell us how, how we do that. For he who promised is faithful and let us consider how we may spur one another. Your relationships, how to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up, meeting together. Oh, you want to hold on unswervingly? You want to stop kind of getting tossed by the wind and carried off and then find yourself at the end of another year going, dang it, I missed it again. I, 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 why, why, how did I get over here? He says, let us not give up meeting together as some are actually in the habit of doing but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day, and he's talking about that final day of Jesus' return, as you see that day approaching. Um, it doesn't matter how strong you are or how, how, faith, how much faith you have. You need other people in your life. And I want to use an example. I want to use David as an example to show you this and show you what happens when we get together and, and how, how much we are better together because David is the king of Israel. He is the friend of God, a man after God's own heart, and he is like the giant slayer. He is victorious in battlefield. He is so revered and respected, yet he chooses to live an interdependent life. He chooses not to isolate himself, but to live interdependent. Look at 1 Chronicles with me. Chapter 11 says, this is a list of the leaders over David's warriors who actually helped David's kingdom get strong. And all the people of Israel also supported David's kingdom. And then he calls them these heroes. These are great, valiant people. And all the people of Israel made David king. David did not make himself. He was not a self made man. He understood the power of getting some smart people, some strong people. He was secure in and of himself to say, you know what? I need to get some better people around me. We're better together. Let me give you a few reasons why out of David's life, we're better together. And this is actually very relevant for us today because we are launching our small group sign up start today. And I'd encourage you to get connected to a community. For some of you, this is a step that you need to take. It's, it's a step in the maturity continuum for you to actually see the better things that God has for you. This is a step because when we get together, here's what happens. Number one, when we get together, we call out the best in each other. That's what we do as the body of Christ. When we, you got enough people calling out the worst in you, seeing the bad in you. You need to get around some people who are calling out the best in you. That's what we do when we get together. 1 Samuel chapter 16 tells about God sends a prophet, sends somebody into David's life. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. I love this. Samuel sees David. God sends a messenger to David's house to call out the best in David. God knows he wasn't receiving that from his home. No one was speaking life and calling the best out of David. In fact, it was probably the opposite. David was one of the youngest, was not even included in the lineup of someone who, could, who his dad thought could even be king. No one was calling out the best in David, but God said, I got a plan for his life. Listen, the same is true for you. God has some key relationships for you, some people that can call out the best in you when you don't even see it yourself, some gifts, some qualities, some things inside of you. God has relationships for you, that he wants someone to speak that life, that destiny inside of you. God, man, we got enough haters in our life. You need to get around people who are calling out the best. In fact, if I could speak to that real briefly, some of you need to get away from some people that are not calling out the best in you. 
They're speaking the wrong things into you. They're calling out the wrong things inside of your life. Here's, here's what God's design. I love it. Community is actually God's answer to, to growth. God could have done it a lot of different ways. He could have developed and grew David up to a king in a lot of different ways, but he said, no, 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 I want David. I want to use other people to help David. Because David, I don't want you to get it twisted, David, that you're a self-reliant, self-made man. You need people. Community is God's answer to growth. And this flies in the face of our culture, maybe even to some of your paradigms, what you think, what you believe. Some of you may believe that the more sermons and podcasts you listen to, the more spiritual you are. And that's not the truth. Some of you may think you know, the more you read your Bible or memorize your Bible, the, the more you're growing spiritually. And that's not always true. I'll go, go ahead, listen to the podcast, listen to the messages, come. Man, come and be a part. And, and read your word and meditate on the word. But that is not how you grow spiritually. It's part of the growth. But God says in Proverbs chapter 27, that as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens another friend. That, that in order for me to grow, I, I yes, study the word, let me hear the word and know the word, but I have to have a place to practice the word. And the way God says you practice the word is in your relationships. All of you could be model Christians if you were stranded on an island by yourself, right? I don't know, I'm just a model Christian, man. I got no one to argue with, no one to butt heads with. It's just, notice, I want you to notice, though, here in this scripture, he says, friend. You have, to, you have to invest the relational equity into actually developing some relationships. Don't assume you're iron just because you go to the same church. You, got, you, have to, you have to actually develop those relationships in order for it to grow you, in order for something sharpening to happen. It's going to take some time to develop a friendship in the body of Christ, not just an acquaintance, not just passing by, but step out. That's what we do in groups. We call out the best in each other. Here's the second thing we do. When we get together, we call out to God for each other. We cry out to God for each other. Back to David's life here. There is a 14-year gap between the time he's anointed to the time he's appointed. And that, again, just shows you there is a journey of maturation that God wants to develop faith, develop character, that this maturity continuum isn't instant, but it's a process that God wants to take you on. And it was 14 years. And here David is under a different king by the name of Saul, who's a very insecure leader. David is a good opposite. Saul and David, if you read First and Second Samuel, David is a secure leader who puts hero, heroes, valiant warriors, leaders, counselors, advisors around him because he knows he's better with them. But Saul is insecure, is threatened by talent, is threatened by the gifts of others, by the abilities of others, so he diminishes and devalues and removes people from his office who threatens his leadership. Amen? Anyone in need of leadership need to go study Saul and David, okay? So, so what he does, what Saul does, is he doesn't like David getting all the credit and David winning battles and stuff like that, so he actually tries to kill David. He tries to kill him. doesn't like that he's being successful under his reign, so he's like, I need to get rid of this kid. So what God does, I love this, God sends David another friend. Look at 1 Samuel. Chapter 23, while David was at Horesh, which is different than, than the co-worker that wears that kind of clothes that you don't like, this is the place, Horesh, the desert of Ziph. Dang it, I'm so sorry, y'all. Pray for your pastor. So bad. I'm human, all right? <laughs> he, learned, <laughs> he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son, look at this, Jonathan, went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. I love, I, I love this about, about God, man. He, there's some stuff that, is, that, that you're going to face that is hard, that is tough. Hey, this year even, maybe you've already started to face some things. There are some things you're going to come up against this year that are hard. It's tough, man. There are some things you're going to struggle up against that. But please listen to me. You are not meant to struggle alone. God does not, he did not create you to fight those battles alone. In fact, God, here is a community is God's answer to loneliness. This is God's, God's remedy for the loneliness that exists in our, in our lives. The Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. I love how God works. He sends a friend to David's life. And this is how you know, I mean, this is a good friend. It says he helped him find strength in God. That's, that's what a good friend will do. 
a good friend will, will help you find strength, and God will, will kind of re... And I'm actually I'm doing a sermon series coming up in February. It's our relationship sermon called, called Relationships Uncensored. And one of my messages that I'm preparing is how to not suck as a friend. That's the title of it, how to not suck as a friend. Because if you want to not, because good friends will actually, when, when he'll, they will help point you to, back to God, get you realigned and readjusted and help you find strength in God. Your sucky friends actually try to, say, compare you with other people. And they're like, oh, no, no, they're, they're terrible, they're terrible. And they'll, they'll try to validate you and affirm you, not by finding it in God, but by diminishing other people. You better be careful around those people. That's actually the opposite of what God wants to do, that, you would, that community is God's answer to loneliness. What those life suckers are going to do in your life is they try to isolate you just to themselves by comparing other people and say, oh, no, you're better than them and that, 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 this. And they'll, they'll talk negatively and diminish value in other people to esteem value in you instead of pointing you to God. Oh, side note there, but that's coming. That is coming, that message. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 7 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. And again, notice it says a friend, even a, a brother, that it suggests that you're taking time out of your schedule and out of your busyness to develop some relationships in the body of Christ, to develop a friendship, a brotherhood, a sisterhood. Because I got news for you, this is coming. Adversity is coming. And, and, and maybe you, some of you are here today and you're like, no, I'm good. I'm good. You're in that independent stage of continuing, thinking that you're good when really you're not better. You're made for better, not good. You're made for better. And until you step into interdependence, you won't see it. Adversity is coming. And it's at that stage when it hits, you're going to want a friend. You're going to wish you had a brother. You're going to wish you had a sister. And I see this and it breaks my heart. If I could just have a real moment with you because I love you. Those of you that call Discovery home, I'm your pastor. I'm your friend. I love you, man. You need to get into some community because when adversity comes, uh, sometimes I get the Hail Mary. We'll get a Hail Mary call at the office or, or something. Someone come rescue. Help. Uh, and every now and then, it's, and we'll try. We'll try to send pastors and, 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 and get some help to people, leaders to people. But, but every now and then, I found out, like, okay, you know, how long you been coming to Discovery? You need help? You're going through something? And you're calling the church? How long have you become to Discovery? A couple years. Some of you have been here for years, and you have not stepped into community. And, and when adversity hits, you have no friends to help you. You have no brothers to come alongside you. You're wondering, why aren't I getting texts? Why aren't I getting visited? Well, could it? And I'm, serious, like, I'm, only, I'm only one man. I, I love you. I love you. But I, we have not developed a ministry and a system here at Discovery where there's a rock star pastor doing everything. I cannot... Can I just be honest with you? I cannot adequately shepherd and care for every one of your adversity moments. I can't. I haven't, we have not structured discovery in that way that I, that I sacrifice my health and my family to go be there in all of your adversities. That's not. That's not. I have other people, other pastors and leaders, and, and that's where small, small groups is, is the atmosphere where most of the care at Discovery happens, where you have praying for one another, caring for one another, bearing one another's burdens. That's where a lot of it happens, and I'm telling you, you're going to miss out on the, on, on the strength of the body of Christ because you're treating church like an event to go to instead of a body to belong to, and I, I want you so desperately to, to have better this year to experience different this year and some of you are dependent on my sermons and you need to grow up come on amen somebody i love you i love you i love you all right but I, i'm just i'm trying to help you i really am i really trying to help you position your life for better get connected to this is a step that some of you need to take you need to you need to take a step of faith and get outside of your comfort zone and build some relationships get a sisterhood around you man Get a brotherhood around you, some people that can, that can call out the best in you. Some people, man, that, that know you and cry out to God for you. You develop that friendship. You, it takes time, but you develop that thing, man. That's what you're created for. You're, and here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. When we get together, we call out the truth in each other. Now, this is a good test to see and help you assess where you're at in the maturity continuum. Um, how many of you are grateful when a friend speaks honestly and truthfully into your life, even when it hurts? Anyone? Anyone that hurts? Hurt me? Hurt me? That's okay? Okay. Then you love my messages, huh? Because I love you. I, I, I love to hurt you, though, too, a little bit because you, 
We need it. We need it. But that's, that, if, if that is, if that is like, yep, that shows that you're ready for more you know, mature relationships. Back to David, though, because David slowly drifts away from God, slowly drifts away from his community, from his advisors, his, his leaders, and he just kind of slowly, slowly isolates what happens to many of our journeys of faith. We just kind of slowly drift. He ends up making a huge mistake, but God, again, sends him a relationship. And some of you know the story in 2 Samuel, the prophet Nathan you know, comes and calls it out of David. He actually, you can go read the story. I don't have time to tell you, but he tells him an analogy, a story that was actually a representation of David, but David didn't know. He was saying, hey, there's this, all this, this guy did this terrible thing in this story I heard, David, and what do you think we should do to him? And David gets all mad, and, and, and the prophet Nathan says to David, you're the man in the story, dude. That was you. And, and he calls out in the guts of this guy to call out the truth inside this king who had authority to kill him. Really, he could have killed him, but, but he, he loved David enough to confront him. He loved David's family and the nation enough, which he led to confront the issue that he, that he saw. And David was able to experience the brokenness and the repentance and the realignment into his life because a friend called out the truth in him. And that's what we do when we get together, man. We call out the truth in each other. Now, don't be afraid. You don't get to a small group and we're all, aha! That's not what happens. You build up. You build the trust. You build the relationships. It don't, don't be afraid. It's okay, but you build it, right? Why? Because community is God's answer to accountability. Community is God's answer to accountability. What does that mean? You can't hold people accountable that you haven't developed community with. Stop trying to, you know, stop trying to, you know, critique people's life from a distance, get in people's life, walk alongside them, and now you are someone who can, a friend and a brother, who can hold somebody accountable. That's what happens when we get together. Here's Proverbs 27. Let me, I got to wrap it up. An open rebuke is what? It's better, man. An open rebuke is better than a hidden love. Wounds from a, a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. It's just, it's better when we call out the best when I'm in, when I, I, I know I can't, I can't live independent. I'm not, I'm not a self-made man. I'm going to choose interdependence because I'm better together. We're going to call out the best in each other. We're going to, we're going to call or cry out to God for each other. And we are going to speak the truth to each other. That's what Discovery Church does when we get together in small groups. Today, you should have got one of these when you came in, this small group. This has almost all of our groups. There's 52 groups. We printed these early because of printing time. Not all of them made it, but there's some tables outside. You can sign up at the tables. You can sign up online. You can even do it through the connection card. There's a lot of different types of groups, but I just want to encourage you. You can sign up starting today. Today, you can sign up through a lot of different means. We try to make it easy, and they're starting next week. Next week, all of them launch and start, and some of you, you're one step away from better one step, man, and to get outside of your comfort zone and get into a group and develop a sisterhood, a brotherhood, because we're better together. Amen? Let me pray for us. Go ahead and bow your heads all right there. Come on. Some of you are here with every head bowed, every eye closed. Help me out. Everyone should be praying right now. Some of you are here, and, and, and maybe you, you, you just recognize that, that you've been living kind of your own way, you know, very independently, maybe even living your own plan, your own goals, your own agenda. And you just recognize today that you were made for more, that you were made for better, and that without Christ, it doesn't work. His plan is better than your plan. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. That's it. God can give you a fresh start and a clean slate right now. One prayer, one decision. With every head bowed and I close it, that's you. And you're tired of just doing it yourself? Can I pray for you? I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out. But I'd love to pray for you. If, if, if you are, maybe uh, you need to come back to God and re-give you know, give him your life. Some you need to, for the very first time, make Jesus the Lord of your life and surrender. I'd love to pray for you right where you're seated. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. And I want you, with every head, out, every head bowed, every eye closed, I want you to be bold on the count of three. I want you to raise up your hand and lift it up real high so I can see. And I'd love to pray for you. Come on, if you're ready for a fresh start, if you're ready for better, one, two, three, lift up that hand, lift it high, be bold. Yes, all over this place. Come on, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 all over. Yeah, yes, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus, here and here, there, yep, here, yeah. Praise you, Jesus, right there, there, there. 
all over this place. God, you're so good. We need you, God. We don't want to do it without you, God. Go ahead and put your hands down. Will you whisper something like this? With your own words, will you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I don't want to live without you anymore. I need you. Jesus, I declare you are my Lord, my Savior. Thank you, God, for saving me. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Help me to live for you from this day forward. Thank you, God, for a fresh start. God, I speak over every person right now that, that is living dependent on other people, putting expectations on, on their relationships, on people, on their kids, on, 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 on their work, on, on just all in the wrong places, God. They don't own their emotions, their intellect, their life. God, I pray that you would teach us this year that we would walk out the necessary steps, skills, principles, and truths to become independent, but not just to become self-reliant, Lord, but that we would step into authentic community, that we would get on teams and groups and, and see better things happen this year than we've ever seen before. We thank you for it. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today. Amen. Awesome.